hormone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. ERT. Like I'm, I'm sure you get this all the time. People saying, what are you taking? You must be on that TRT stuff. In fact, when I was up at the lake at the gym, uh, I am now known as the old man, apparently at the gym. I was taking a rest between my sets and I hear this, hey, old man, what cycle are you on? Welcome to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast with Lee Hayward and Jeff Samataro. Since 1997, Lee Hayward's Total Fitness Bodybuilding has been online helping guys to build muscle, lose fat, and become the best version of themselves. The goal of this podcast is to provide you with real-world practical fitness and nutrition advice to look your best, improve your health, and feel confident in your own skin so you can live life to the fullest without having your body holding you back from doing the things you want to do. So if you're ready to get started, let's jump into the show. Welcome everyone to the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast. Lee Hayward here, joined with Jeff Samatero, and we have a special guest, Mike Brown, joining us. Jeff, I mean, you went through the whole Muscle After 40 Blueprint program, and you're helping out behind the scenes running the, the show. And I know, Mike, you've gone through the program as well, and you've made an amazing transformation. And we basically just want to share that, like share the journey, right? And Mike is more than muscle after 40. He's muscle after 50 and now muscle after 60. Yep. <laughs> so we're, we're moving right <laughs> along here. And that's what I really want to talk about is how it's possible to make progress in your 40s, 50s, 60s and beyond. And that's exciting. When I'm seeing your progress, I mean, that's giving me hope for the future. I'm like, hey, I'm only a young buck. <laughs> because when I was growing up, the thought of being 40, like that seemed old. I mean, I'm sure like you can probably relate to that too, Mike. Like when you were, yeah. if somebody was 40 years old, that, that was old. I've seen a couple of people recently post, oh my God, I turned 40. And I'm like, you're a child. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Right? <laughs> Muscle After 40 is a program for children. Right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I still got four more years until I'm old. Right? <laughs> but yeah, so like, let's just uh, introduce you, Mike. I mean, like, obviously, like, just a quick little intro, like, where are you from? Well, I'm here in Atlanta. Uh, mm -hmm. I grew up in Iowa, but yeah. I moved to Atlanta when I got married. So I've been down here th almost 38 years, looking forward to moving from Atlanta. We we will be moving to Minnesota at some point. Uh, gotcha. Just people retire south, we're retiring to the snow country. Doing the opposite. <laughs> right. Well, now you're strong enough, you can shovel that snow. <laughs> or hire it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or you can do that too. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, like, let's just talk about your intro into fitness now. I mean, because sure. I, I, I know where you're coming from, because we've chatted about this multiple times before, right. but like your background, I mean, you were a teacher, you were a lawyer, and when you were a working professional, fitness was not top priority for you, you know, right. just elaborate on that. Well, fitness was never a priority for me. I, in fact, I'm going through and scanning slides from when I was a child mm -hmm. to get rid of, as we're decluttering the house, getting ready to move. And I just scanned some slides from when I was nine and 10 and I was chubby back then. Uh, I was not an athlete, uh, sports, no, uncoordinated. I'm still uncoordinated. You know, it just is what it is. Uh, there was a very brief period when I was in my thirties where I had lost a bunch of weight because I had been sick and I decided let's work out and try to get into shape. Clearly I wasn't doing anything because I never gained any size and I never had any definition. And then I decided to go to law school. And of course, that took the, all of my time. That was when I was 36 uh, is when I, I literally stopped working out in 1998. And then we started law school in 1999. From the time that at that point, I was like 150 pounds ish. And by the time I decided to do something about it, I had ballooned up to 220 pounds. The last time I weighed myself, I don't even know if that's what my maximum was. The last time I weighed myself before I started on Weight Watchers, I was at 220 pounds, lost a bunch of weight, went off of Weight Watchers because they changed the program and didn't like it, gained another 50 pounds and then lost 30 of that. So when I started in, in 2019, I was down to, I think, 167 pounds and I would do the elliptical every day. So, you know, rain or shine, it, I was on the elliptical anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes doing the elliptical. The body fat didn't go down, uh, certainly didn't gain any muscle from doing that. So finally, in spring of 2020, I said I needed to do something different. So I started doing uh, training with resistance bands on August 14th, I think it was, of 2020. Very specific date you know, that I remember. And I liked it. 
And I, I hired a coach. And it, it, as we've talked about before, very nice young guy. He was in his early 30s. Um, and of course, at that point, I was 56 going on 57. Or I was probably was 57 when I hired him. Mm-hmm. And in the spring of 2021, I was um, talking to him and I said, you know, I'm just not making the gains that I see other people on the internet making. And his response to me in the email was, well, you know, you are beyond middle age. And it, because you're beyond middle age, you can't make any gains. And I kind of went, well, wait a minute, that didn't make any sense to me. Not to mention, why am I paying you as a coach if I'm not going to make any gains? You know, that made no sense. I said, okay, well, we're done. And then after that is when I found your program with Muscle After 40. So that would have been in, it was around, it was around uh, Memorial Day of 2021 mm-hmm. when I started with um, at Muscle After 40. And things worked really well. Um, it switched from bands, resistance bands to, to weights. And I really liked it. And in, I think it was the fall of 2021, somebody challenged me to do a bodybuilding show. And I thought, I can do that. And we talked about it and you didn't laugh. So, you know, it was like, okay, I think I can do this. And we, we've just gone since there. It's wow. been a lot of fun. There's there's so much to unpack with that. But I, that's, that's a great introduction, Mike. I appreciate you for sharing that. When you started, you like you were consistent doing cardio. You mentioned like doing the elliptical machine. You weren't gaining weight or losing weight. So you were kind of like in a plateau and you weren't really improving your body composition. So it, it goes to show, I mean, obviously cardio is important. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's important for heart health and cardiovascular health and, and all that stuff. But it's not a great tool for body composition improvements. Right. I love cardio. I mean, I compete in cycling races now and I've gotten more serious into that. And I... I love it for the sport of it, but it's not a physique enhancement tool. It's it's great for managing body fat because it's a great calorie burner, but you're not going to build an impressive looking physique doing cardio. Right. And we see this, like you go to any local race, like you go to a local marathon or a local uh, triathlon or cycling event or whatever. And people's physique, they may be thin, but they're very average looking. Like if you didn't see them actually doing their sport, like they wouldn't look like an athlete for the most part. Now, it's different when you get to the elite level. Like if you're at the Olympics or something where you're talking about like the cream of the crop, the elite of the elites, those those are unique specimens just to be at that level. But I'm talking about like normal people. You, you wouldn't even know they were athletes or that they exercise just looking at their physique for the most part. So like if you want to get the best bang for your buck for building muscle, losing fat, and looking like you work out, looking like you're fit, the weight training and the strength training, that's key. Right. You mentioned also you started with resistance bands. Yes. So that was your introduction to strength training, resistance bands. It was, yeah, at least yeah. this time. I mean, I did I did weightlifting back in uh, the 90s during that three-year period or so. Yeah, and that was with weights. But here again, what I did back then is I, I owned every bodybuilding book that was out there. So if they had 15 bicep res, uh, exercises, I would do 15 bicep re- exercises so, you know, versus knowing what to actually do. So I literally would not pick and choose. I would just do the whole thing. And it's like, well, this is not working. Well, duh. (laughs) I wonder why a little overtraining or, you know, not doing it correctly or, or, or whatever. A three hour bicep workout. (laughs) Go through Arnold's encyclopedia bodybuilding. Okay. Every bicep exercise, right? That's my workout right there. Well, and see, I was stupid enough to think if they put it in the book, that must be part of the workout. Now, did I bother reading the rest of the book to say how you're supposed to, to design your workouts? No. <laughs> uh, I'm just curious, Jeff, like what was your introduction to strength training? Because I know like you're relatively new to the strength training world. Like, Was it r- with weights right off the bat or did you like bridge the gap with resistance bands or something like that? Uh, I started out with uh, working out with my dad. My dad had a home gym. Okay. when i was a kid and he used to have buddies from work come over all the time and they would lift down in the basement so uh, there was a couple times where i went down with him and we would we just work with some dumbbells uh and he showed me just the basics of like about pushing pulling uh different types of like body weight lun- uh, lunge exercises and then when and then i did absolutely nothing after that all through high school zero physical activity whatsoever actually purposely avoided physical activity in high school because uh, i was a music kid so we you you know you didn't want to be a jock or whatever yes yeah, so i didn't do anything all through high school but then uh, when i got out of college i uh, had a buddy of mine who was in the national guard 
and he was working out consistently. We had a, we worked together, so we would commute back and forth to work. And uh, on the way home, we would always stop at the gym. And he was great because he was super motivated to work out. So we would work out together, and just by being around him, he would push me to 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 be better. So, so I learned a lot from him. Eventually, he moved on, and our we didn't work at that job anymore. So then we stopped kind of hanging out, and then I stopped going because the whole reason why I was going is because we'd be driving home, and he'd be like, "Let's go to the gym." I'd be like, mm-hmm. Okay, I got nothing better to do. So. I didn't do anything for a little while after that. And then that's when I ballooned up and then getting back into it again, I inherited that home gym that I had mentioned from my dad when I was a kid. So when he moved out of my childhood home, he asked if I wanted the weights and I said, yeah, because I always kind of uh, envisioned myself getting into shape at some point in my adult life. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, I didn't really, I didn't want to do any of that, but I knew because I had watched my parents work out and be physically active all through my childhood that eventually the day would come where I would have to start doing something. And I had talked to guys who were older too. And I remember them saying the same thing to me too. They're like, Oh, you're going to have to work out because you're going to have to (laughs) like, it's just something you need to do when you get older. So I'm glad I had that guidance because I I always had it in the back of my mind that it was going to work out that way. So I started lifting weights in the basement with just some minimal equipment, and then I started adding to it over time. I got the power rack. I got all these different types of attachments, uh, pulley system. Uh, I got the full dumbbell rack. I had an exercise bike. I had a vertical leg press. And then I started getting into calisthenics, and I had this massive home gym downstairs, and I didn't need any of it anymore. So, (laughs) So I ended up selling all of it. And uh, on Facebook Marketplace, and now when I work out, it's all body weight training, Olympic ring stuff, calisthenics, um, and I, I do have some kettlebells for leg training, but I keep it pretty minimal. And I pride myself in in staying in shape with not needing too much equipment because I find it to be very very convenient to be able to work out anywhere and any time that I want to. Uh, and I've never personally liked the commercial gym atmosphere. I know some guys love it, but just for me personally, it's just I've never been into going to a commercial gym. So I love calisthenics now, and I I love the whole setup I have, and I'm going to continue on with it because I've, ha- I've made a lot of progress with calisthenics. But it just goes to show, like, there's so many uh, avenues. I mean, obviously, resistance bands, I mean – they work calisthenics it works the the gym works like it's Mm -hmm. it's really the consistency the most important thing i know in in mike's case like you started off with the calisthenics or no not calisthenics in mike's case you started off with the resistance bands so like how long were you using the resistance bands for before you actually jumped into a weight training workout about seven months so i started in august of 2020 and by april i won't say bored with it um, I didn't feel like I was making enough progress. And a friend of mine on Facebook started to add dumbbells. And I thought, oh, I could do that. And I had a full dumbbell set at the time. So I, I started adding dumbbells and I liked that better. And then um, when I came on with the, the Muscle After 40, my original program, you had some weights and some resistance bands or optional to do bands. And I just went straight with the weights. I, I, I had a home gym. So I didn't have to go out and go to a commercial gym. It's since changed. I wound up taking that equipment to the lake house and bought all new stuff for here in Atlanta, you know, because I decided I wanted something that was a little bit safer than what I had. For example, um, uh, the functional trainer I have, I did not have a functional trainer. It was just a rack. And I wanted something that if I dropped a weight, I wasn't going to crush myself, that sort of thing. And wound up buying that and then have added on since then. You've expanded and I know you've got a very well equipped home gym. Yeah. Yeah, And wh- where do you find most of your equipment for the gym? Because this is a big one. Like a lot of people who are probably thinking about start setting up a home gym. So, well, the, the functional trainer I bought at a, a commercial fitness store here in Atlanta because I did not want to use one that I, I didn't know if it had been abused or anything like that. When, when you have cables and things like that, you want to make sure everything is in good shape. Some of the things I bought off the marketplace you know, with Facebook, my um, Smith machine I bought, I found a, a great price on uh, Facebook marketplace, my standing calf raise. Uh, there was a, a gentleman that um, decided he didn't need it anymore. He was going to use his leg press machine instead. So uh, I've gotten some things that way. And the, uh, there was also a used equipment company up in Anderson, South Carolina. And I bought my set of fixed dumbbells through them because 
it was a commercial set and it was a great price. It was one of those that I could not pass up the price. Uh, I had to drive up to get it. It was a couple hours uh, to drive, but even that the cost of gas to get up and pick it up was cheaper than if I could bought it new. Yeah. I mean, you can get some real deals if, if you shop around. I mean, it's the thing is, it's not guaranteed. Like you, you go on Facebook marketplace today, there might be nothing there, but if you just keep your eyes open, you may luck into it. And I, I did the same thing. I lucked into a good home gym through Facebook marketplace. Definitely worth checking out. And for the most part, when it comes to good quality gym equipment, especially if it's commercial grade, and, and there's different levels of commercial grade, you could have what they refer to as like light commercial, which is ideal for small gyms, like a home gym or a hotel gym or something like that. And then you have the, you know, the heavy duty commercial, which is what you're going to have like in a gold's gym or a powerhouse, you know, something that's going to take the abuse of a lot of people lifting a lot of weight, but you don't necessarily need heavy commercial equipment for a home gym. The light commercial grade stuff is usually adequate for most people. In addition to your home gym, you also go to a commercial gym as well, don't you? I do because I don't have uh, a lateral raise machine, which is one thing that I needed to really improve on. Mm -hmm. And I don't have room for either a leg press or a hack squat machine, which I use at the gym. So I, I do shoulders and I do legs at the commercial gym or part of my leg routine I do at the, at the commercial gym. Uh, the rest of it I do in the, at home. And the gym is only a half mile down the road. Now, when I go to the lake house, I drive to a gym and use all their equipment because I don't like what I have, my old stuff. Um, not to mention it's an air conditioned. So I was, when I was up there three weeks ago, it was 91 degrees in the storage building where I had my equipment and no air circulation. I, I, I did two workouts and I said, I'll drive the 45 minutes each way. But I love how you're doing that. Like you're kind of stacking the deck in your favor. You have a home gym, you have a gym membership, like you're, you're covering all your bases. And, and I'm kind of the same way. Like I've got a home gym and I love having a gym membership as well. But you, you have the options, you know, if, if you're busy, you don't have time to get to the gym, you can still do something at home, right. right? Then if you do have the time to drive to the gym and you want to get in a good workout, that's an option as well. I love how you do that. You're really planning things in advance around your workouts, mm -hmm. right? Trying to optimize things. Yeah, I do. And I schedule my workouts. So it's non-negotiable, which is part of the Muscle After 40 plan. One of the first lessons they say, schedule your workouts. And I've done that since uh, 2021. And it's non-negotiable. That comes first. So I schedule everything else around my workout, whether it's a doctor appointment or like this afternoon, I'm going to the chiropractor. You know, it's after the workout. Gotcha. You got the workout done. Workout's in the bank. <laughs> well, because when I was still working, if I if I didn't do the workout first thing in the morning, I didn't know what time I was getting home at night as a, an attorney. I was a prosecutor. So sometimes you would get called to court or you would be in, in trial until late. And I wasn't going to come home at eight o'clock and then try to do a workout. I would rather get up at five in the morning and do it before I went to work. Mm -hmm. I've just continued after I retired in 2020, I've continued that it's my, my workout is first thing in the morning. And Jeff, you do the same thing, don't you? You work out first thing in the morning, right? I do. Yeah. Yeah. And I do the same thing Mike does. I schedule my workouts and I plan everything around it. Unless I absolutely have to, there's no way that I can get around it. Then yeah, I always schedule everything around it and make sure that I have that time allocated every single morning. I try to do it at the same time though every day. So I trade it's always 9 30 a.m. is when I'll start working out. Maybe get started a little bit earlier if I have some other things going around, but it's always around that time. Success leaves clues. You two of you have made impressive transformations and two of your structure your workouts, you get it done in the morning. This is powerful stuff because like a lot of people are wondering, like, how do you make this work? You you make it work by planning in advance. You know, the whole saying, mm -hmm. if, uh, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. It's like, that's kind of what's happening. Here. So you guys are planning it in advance. I love well, that. and it's not just the workouts. It's the getting your gym clothes and gym bag ready the night before. Mm -hmm. I learned that years ago in the 90s when I was working on it. If I didn't get it together the night before, I would either forget something like get to get there and not have any shoes or you know something ridiculous. Or I, eh, I just don't feel like going today. It was much easier to go, grab the bag and go if it was already ready. Same with meals. I prepare, you know, at least tomorrow's meals will be prepared this evening. So I don't have to do that first thing in the morning. And that that really makes a difference. In fact, I just traveled cross country, got home Sunday night, got home around eight o'clock and I still cooked my meals for Monday morning, which I debated not doing because that, you know, but I thought, you know, if I don't, I could get up and do it certainly. But if I don't, I'm, I know I'll regret it in the morning. And so I, I spent the time doing it Sunday night. And yeah, I would have regretted it Monday morning had I not done that because I certainly didn't feel like doing it Monday. I plan out what I'm going to eat during the week too. 
like uh, on Sunday, I'll map out like exactly like, all right, Monday, I'm going to eat this Tuesday. I'm going to eat this. And I go all the, all the way through, through the week. So yeah, everything's pretty meticulous and pretty planned out ahead of time. I don't really leave anything to chance because uh, nobody succeeds on accident. Having a plan, I feel like is such a crucial first step that you need to take. And, and talking about diet and meal prep and stuff, this is another topic I really want to dive into because I know both of you have followed ketogenic diets and Mike went to the extreme of ketogenic with carnivore and intermittent fasting. And this is a hot topic. Like you go in on any fitness group or forum or whatever, you're going to hear the, the topic of carnivore diets. And I just want you to kind of share your experience with it because, I mean, you you went through it. First off, how did you find out about carnivore diet and what motivated you to want to try it? Right? Well, for me, I was on a Facebook group with the resistance bands. And one of the guys that had big success in that was carnivore and intermittent fasting. So I thought, well, if it worked for him, I mean, look at his results. That should work for me. Here again, I'm super gullible. Uh, <laughs> so I thought, let's try this. So I did keto for about two weeks and then decided to switch to carnivore, partly because I went in and had a DEXA scan and saw what my body fat percentage was. And I was horrified. So everyone's like, oh, you need to do intermittent fasting and you need to do carnivore. So, okay, I did. And I followed what he did. And it was extreme intermittent fasting. We've laughed about this before. Uh, I would eat Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and I would fast Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, and Sunday. So I would, and I would have one meal a day and I ate first thing in the morning. So literally I would do my workout at five. I would have about two and a half pounds of meat at seven. And that was it for until two days later. It worked. I, I'm not saying that it didn't work. Was it fun? Yeah, it didn't really bother me. I mean, I always knew what I was going to have because I knew it was going to be meat. It might be a beef versus a pork roast or something. That was about the only choice. It was expensive, as you can imagine. Because, of course, it wasn't just, oh, my, as my coach said then, uh, you don't want just beef. You want grass-fed beef, <laughs> which add a little bit. And I'm sure it's probably healthier to have the grass-fed, but add a little bit more money to it. And, uh, but yeah, sure, the body fat went from 23.5% down to 11.3% in seven months. A lot of loose skin, still do. And my cholesterol went up 153%. My doctor was horrified. He said, what have you done? <laughs> um, so I quit... When I started with you, I quit. So that was in, in uh, May of 21. And by July, my uh, cholesterol was back down to where it should have been. In fact, it's dropped again. The last time I had my blood work done, it's, it's dropped again. So I'm back down to a normal, really good range on cholesterol. Wow. So carnivore was a disaster for your cholesterol levels. Yeah. And I didn't hate it. I mean, you know, because... I like I like to eat meat. That was not a problem. It was very easy to plan because uh, I knew what I was going to have. Didn't have to really think about it. Maybe change on how I uh, cooked it. You know, oh, I discovered sous vide cooking. That was awesome. You know, because you could do a little bit different things with it. But yeah, is a sustainable lifestyle probably not. Uh, one of the things that they claim was that oh, it boosts your testosterone level. It didn't for me. Okay. Yeah, not at all. In fact, I, uh, during that time, I also started TRT, you know, testosterone replacement therapy. If it weren't for that, my testosterone would have still been down in the 200s. There just wasn't any, any change. The only thing that changed literally was my cholesterol. Too bad it couldn't bump your uh, testosterone. Right. Like, bump your <laughs> cholesterol, right? right? <laughs> From a weight loss point of view, I mean, it absolutely works. I and mean, I think there's, there's a couple of key things you're, you're doing there with that carnivore slash intermittent fasting. And it probably could have worked with other diet plans if you were following the same caloric intake. Because first off, you're eating one meal every other day. That is a huge caloric deficit either way you slice it. Now, granted, it was a big meal. You said it was like two pounds. Yeah, two and a half pounds. Two and a half pounds of meat. So, right. And I'm sure this was probably like, wasn't the leanest cuts of meat either. It was probably the full fat meat, was it? Probably. <laughs> like, like you're eating a two and a half pound roast, right? right. The whole shebang, right? The, the, the fat, the, the whatever, you know, you're not trimming it down. And because that's the whole idea of carnivore, right? You're eating protein and fat. You're eating the meat. That's right. You know, it's the extreme version of keto. Obviously it worked from a fat loss, weight loss point of view. You mean yeah. you slash your body fat significantly. So well, I mean, the other thing that I didn't mention is when I, I would have DEXA scans like every three months to see how things were going, not only did it cut the body fat, it also cut the lean mass too. 
Oh, okay. Which I wasn't expecting because I was expecting that to go up from what everyone said. I mean, it wasn't a huge amount, but it was still down as opposed to up. And that would, to me was a little bit of a surprise. I wasn't expecting that. I was, you know, I was expecting fat to go down and lean to go up. Just kind of what you hear a lot of people preach with the carnivores. Yeah, you're going to achieve this body recomposition, you know, slash your body fat, fill out your frame with muscle, jack your testosterone, like right. the, the the pros of carnivore, but you know, the, the real world results don't always pan out. That's right. And I know when you came on board with the muscle after 40 program, like that was one thing that I really wanted to focus on is building muscle. And I know you mentioned that you had a coach who said you were too old to build muscle. <laughs> right? You're beyond your middle years or whatever. Yeah, I'm middle age. So the, the big thing that I wanted to focus on is we need to start feeding and nourishing your body and feeding it frequently. So I think we started off like four meals a day and making sure that there was carbohydrates in with each of those meals and not just any type of carbohydrates, but good quality carbohydrates, like ones that are going to fill out your glycogen stores and actually fuel, and nourish your body. And we want to use those carbs to fuel your workouts. So then the protein that you're eating can actually go towards building muscle. Because right. when you're just eating a protein diet, as in carnivore, your body has to break down that protein. I mean, obviously, it's going to utilize it for, for muscle growth and all the bodily functions. But it also has to break that down and try to use it as an energy source. And it's a very inefficient pathway. I mean, protein can get broken down into glucose, but it's so inefficient when your body's breaking down fat and turning it into ketones, yes, you can function on it, but it's not optimal. It's that's like the backup survival mechanism. You know? yeah. That's not our optimal fuel source that we want. Glucose, glycogen, that's our optimal fuel source. So when you're consuming carbohydrates, now you have abundance of that energy to use towards your training. So now you can train harder, you can lift heavier, build more muscle, and also speed up your metabolism and burn more body fat. Because we, we've seen that, like you, you actually gain muscle and you didn't get fat by adding in carbohydrates to your diet. Which right. Pretty remarkable because a lot of people are carbophobes. <laughs> you know, they think as soon as I start eating carbs, I'm going to get fat. So well, here again, as, as I said before, I, I read it on the Internet. I'm stupid enough to believe everything I read is true. You know, especially the, the group that, I, that I'm referring to was the official group of the resistance band company. So I thought maybe these people that are supposedly the experts in that group actually know what they're talking about no everything is like oh carbs are bad don't don't eat carbs don't eat carbs so then when you actually realize no you you do need carbs good carbs it does make a difference <laughs> bottom line is i quit i i dropped out of that group very quickly now i take what i read on a lot of that with a grain of salt mm. i don't care what someone's picture looked like maybe they maybe they know what they're talking about or maybe it's a doctored photoshopped picture maybe it's a picture from 20 years ago who knows I mean, Jeff, is there anything you want to add on that? Because I know you followed a keto diet when you first started your weight loss journey. Yeah, my wife had come home from work one day and she said that she had a coworker who had lost a bunch of weight on keto and that uh, we should try it out. So that's actually how I kind of got into dieting to begin mm -hmm. with. And yeah, I did lose a good amount of weight with it and it was effective. But yeah, no, I didn't like it. I never liked it. It was just something I was doing just to lose weight. And inevitably, when I had gotten down to the goal weight that I had set for myself, I was like, well, now I don't have to do this anymore. Hooray. <laughs> and of course, and then what happens after that, right? All that weight comes back on, it balloons back up, like it comes seems to come back quicker than it came off. <laughs> So even now, I have I still have people who approach me and ask me, they're like, hey, so how do I get into keto? Uh, I, I, somebody reached out to me recently. He's like, I'm like, I'm so overweight and I know I have to keto. But like, <laughs> that's, you didn't even say diet. You said, I know I have to keto. It's just crazy how uh, it's so ingrained now in culture in general, I guess, just like that. Keto seems to be synonymous with losing weight. It just seems to be the case. Everybody seems to be jumping on the keto bandwagon. But yeah, no, I I, I hated it. I couldn't stand it because like I love carbs. I grew up eating oatmeal and uh, and bread, and I I just couldn't imagine like not having those things ever again. And and it was a struggle. You go to restaurants and stuff, and you have to ask for like the burger without the bun and everything. And then and then the waitress looks at you and she's like. Oh, you're ketoing? <laughs> yeah, you're like, yeah, so I'm ketoing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, is that like, I just never enjoyed it. And I just always thought that dieting just meant suffering. 
because that's just like whatever how everybody seems to approach dieting it's like it's gonna suck you're gonna hate it i'm gonna have to diet and when i started working with you it's like i love the diet now so now all of a sudden it's like this isn't even hard to do i can do this forever and that's when i started making the real progress because it wasn't a struggle anymore there wasn't like i couldn't wait to get to the weekend so i could have pizza it goes to, to show like the importance of loving your diet and okay. how that equals like long-term results. Mm -hmm. And diet is just the way we eat. Of course, we have that connotation thinking diet means restriction. Diet means I'm restricting calories. I'm cutting out. I'm eliminating. But loving your diet is basically loving the way you eat. And I, I don't even like to use the word diet. It's it's a lifestyle. It's it's eating habit, mm -hmm. lifestyle. I mean, that's the way I kind of refer to it. It's a pet peeve of mine when people say, you know, what's your diet? You guys must get that question. Like, what diet are you on? Yeah, I, I just want to answer, like, I eat food, like real food. It, it doesn't seem crazy to me. Yep. I say my nutrition plan. I try not to use the word diet because, like you said, diet has a negative connotation. It sounds mm -hmm. like you're restricting everything. I, I'm really not. Maybe now because I'm getting ready for the show, but, you know, it's not cutting out everything. It's not a punishment, in other words. Yeah, I don't feel deprived like right. I used to. And once you enjoy it and you can sustain it and it doesn't feel like you are on a diet, then it's sustainable. Then this is something you can do as a lifestyle. But if it feels like you are constantly relying on grit and willpower and it's like, I can't wait for this to be over, you have that in the back of your mind, then it's only a short term thing. Eventually you will hit that threshold. Like everyone has their degree of willpower and toughness, you know, how much you can suffer it out. But once you hit that threshold and everybody will then you're, you're going to go off the rails and go back to your old habits again. For me, every time I did a bodybuilding show, because I would do the old school approach of the off season bulking where I purposely consumed a calorie surplus and more or less just got fat in the off season unnecessarily. And then I would do the extremes cutting in the, in the pre contest because I had to lose all that fat that I gained in the off season. If, if I could go back in time and make a change, I would have eliminated this whole bulking cutting mindset. I'm not saying that I wouldn't have manipulated my calories, but it wouldn't have been to those extremes where I'm trying to force feed myself to gain weight and then trying to extreme starve myself on chicken and broccoli to lose weight. Mm -hmm. Extremes of also like two plus hours of cardio a day to cut, no cardio to bulk, all or nothing, total extremes. I find having this balanced mm -hmm. approach and just tweaking it ever so slightly, like just adjust your portions a little higher so that you're not in a deficit if you want to gain. And then, hey, just tweak it so you're in a very slight deficit if you want to lose. But the, the core habit lifestyle like doesn't really change. Even the food choices don't right. change. You know, it's not like you get your bulking diet and your cutting diet. It's, it's almost like a blend. It's the same thing. You know, this your nutrition plan, as Mike says. And then you can just manipulate the variables whether you want to gain a little or lose a little. One other thing that, that I just happened to think about with carnivore, where I was eating almost zero carbs, the time you have a carb, it's like, damn, that's kind of good. And then you find yourself binging on carbs and all of a sudden, oh, look what I've done. And then to try to get that out of your system again, that was a lot of work. Christmas, I remember I had made some English coffee and it was in the freezer and I felt like I wanted something sweet. So I had one piece. Well, that turned into eating the entire pound. So I ate, mm -hmm. literally in one sitting and then like the next two weeks to not have any sugar again i was crawling the wall you get do you get it out of your system and you put a little bit back in uh so you know it's much nicer now to be having carbs throughout the day and you know every now and again i'll, I'll feel like i need something sweet and it, it's okay maybe i'll have some a piece of fruit or something uh versus candy or ice cream or, or, or whatever but you get that little bit of sweetness and okay i'm good before let me shove shovel down the whole pint of ice cream or whatever. Yeah. I remember with keto, when you first get into ketosis, you have to go through what's called the keto flu. Have you guys heard about that? Oh yeah. Then they're done that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I remember going through that. That should have been the first dead giveaway that my body doesn't like this. <laughs> I have to go through this sickness to come out the other end. And then every time that I would have a cheat meal or something like that and bump myself out of ketosis i'd have to go through the sickness again to get back into ketosis it's just like what a wild ride that was it's not a sustainable healthy approach it can work from weight loss i mean mike's a prime example of that you're a prime example of that jeff as well like it's it can work from weight loss i mean i've done it and another thing that 
I didn't like about the low carb, zero carb diets is it's not a pleasant topic, but I, I would get constipated. Like I would go from a, a healthy one or two bowel movements a day to one or two a week. Like that's the, the truth when I was on the, the keto diet. I mean, like I always felt bound up because I was literally full of, you know what, <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, Carnivore has the opposite effect. Did you find that, Mike? Oh, yeah. It's called the meat runs. So I guess <laughs> the, the fat and no fiber or anything is, is just literally running through. And When you first start on carnivore, stay close to the bathroom. Really? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was like it was like having a colonoscopy. It was oh. that extreme. It was not fun. Mm. Yeah. Just would not recommend it. Right. <laughs> Carnivore is a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying that it happens to everybody, but uh, in that group when I was reading it, there was other people that were talking about it. It's like, yeah. Okay. So that, that's another topic of health. We want to uh, make sure that we're regular, right? And regular yeah. in a good way. You know, one thing that I know our listeners definitely want to talk about or hear about, hormone replacement therapy, mm -hmm. ERT. Like I'm, I'm sure you get this all the time. People saying, what are you taking? You must be on that TRT stuff. In fact, when I was up at the lake at the gym, uh, I am now known as the old man, apparently at the gym. <laughs> Somebody was, they were talking about some uh, IV infusion, vitamin therapy or something that you can get in town. Uh, I was taking a rest between my sets and I hear this, hey, old man, what cycle are you on? And then I realized they were talking to me. And I said, oh, just TRT. Oh, haven't you tried human growth hormone? No, just TRT. Uh, I started TRT in December of 2020. I went in for testing because I just felt like I needed to because I, I didn't feel great. Uh, I had all the symptoms like low energy and all that sort of thing. I have probably been low T for probably since my 30s. Because uh, like when I was working out before, I never gained any, never gained any size or mass. Even if I wasn't working out right, I I couldn't gain weight. I couldn't put on any definition, any mass or anything. Uh, and when I went in for testing that or that December rather, I was at in the upper two hundreds. So I started testosterone replacement through the doctor, and I have discovered it, it's not the end all and be all. It's not the wonderful magic potion that everyone wants to claim that it is. It's a lot of work. Uh, I have to go in for blood testing every three months to, to make sure my levels are appropriate. Because if you, if you take too much testosterone, it's not good either. So like the, there was uh, uh, the first couple of months when I went in for the testing, my testosterone had gone from the 200s up to like 1500 Whoa. and that's way too high. So we've, we've cut back my dosage two or three times since then to try to get the right levels. But the problem is, is when it's too high, you have other side problems. So for example, erectile dysfunction is one of them. Um, it can affect your heart, it can cholesterol, all of this various things. So you have to go in for regular blood panel testing. I go in every three months. The other thing I did not know until I started this, that happened the first time uh, a year ago in December, I went in for my testing and I got a call from the testosterone clinic saying, you need to come in immediately for what they call a therapeutic blood dump because my hemoglobin and my hematocrit were too high. We had a chance of blood clotting within, well, I was just sitting there type thing. And I said, well, I'm getting ready to go out of town. And I said, do I really have to do this now? And the doctor was like, well, if you don't come in, if you're driving, you will need to get out of the car every hour and walk because otherwise you may develop a clot and have a stroke. So needless to say, I uh, turned around and went to the clinic and did a blood dump. They literally just take out a pint of blood. And what's interesting is that the last few times they've done it, they've taken my blood pressure before and afterward. So before I go in, they, they pull the blood, they'll do the blood pressure, and then they'll do it again afterward. And it's amazing the difference. So it's a lot of work. It's not just taking a shot. There's other side effects as well. You, uh, I take a, a peptide on the day before I take my testosterone shot. I call it Fluffernut. It's to help the boys produce natural testosterone. So you don't have shrinkage and all of that. You know, it is what it is. I don't regret doing it. I'm going to continue doing it. But it is not just something that you can do lightly. I would be fearful if someone just ordered testosterone off the internet 
without going through a doctor because you don't know what dosages you should be taking. I take 220 milligrams or up to that. I don't, I, I've reduced the, the, the shots now. There are people that are taking 600. There are people that are taking four times that. There was somebody the other day was talking, they were taking, they basically were taking 10 times what I'm taking and then wondering why they were having heart problems. You know, and that's because they read it on the internet and that's what bodybuilder somewhere along the line had posted that that was what their, their dosage was. So that that's a little bit worrisome. I certainly would not recommend that, but I don't regret doing it, mm -hmm. but I do do it through my doctor and it is constant monitoring every three months. What you're doing is true TRT. And I want to differentiate this because a lot of people now are using this term like, oh, I'm on TRT. I actually had a, an email from a, a young man there last week. He's 25 years old and he says, oh, I'm on TRT. And he was asking me about dosages and all this kind of stuff. And I said, well, uh, first off, I said, follow your doctor's advice. Oh, well, I'm not doing it through a doctor. And I'm like, well, I, I knew that anyway. Like right. no doctor's going to prescribe a 25 year old TRT. Right. So, I mean, people are using the word TRT as a nice way to say I'm on steroids. Because like back in the day before TRT even became a thing or a term, you were just taking steroids. That's all it was. It was steroid abuse. That's what it is. And that's what a lot of people now are kind of bridging the gap. So they're like, oh, I'm, I'm on TRT, but I'm doing it on my own. Well, that's not TRT. That's steroid abuse. Whether you're ordering off the internet or you're getting it from, you know, some guy at the gym who's digging it out of the bottom of his gym bag. So if you're going to do this properly, you need to go through a proper doctor, a proper clinic and go through the whole process of, as you mentioned, the blood work, the test, because it's not just a, oh, buy a bottle of testosterone and jab it in and hope for the best. Right. <laughs> but that's what most people are doing, right? That's what people are calling TRT. And that that is not testosterone replacement therapy. Well, and to go right along with that, do you know what you're buying off the internet? Yes. Is it really testosterone? Does it have other stuff mixed in with it? Mine comes from the pharmacy uh -huh. you know, versus buying it off the internet where you don't really know what you're getting. They can slap a label on it and call it testosterone, but is it? There's so many underground drugs out there now and the dosages could be way off and, and you don't know what it is that you're getting. You might say that it has 200 milligrams of testosterone siphonate and it might be a different Easter. It might be a different dosage. It might not even be <laughs> testosterone. You don't know how clean it is. It really is a crapshoot. Really well, you know, as, as a former prosecutor that did a lot of drug cases, I'm very aware of that. We, I had a case, I won't tell you who it was against, but it's a well-known pharmaceutical company uh, where they were mixing generic Viagra in the basement of a building in Belize and then shipping it to Canada to import to the United States. There was absolutely no quality control. And we prosecuted that guy. That's I can talk about it because it, it was a uh, it's public record that that's what they were doing. And we actually have pictures of them with the pill press in Belize pressing fake Viagra. And they were saying that it was Canadian Viagra. Right. It was shipped right. from Canada, so from Belize to Canada right. to meet the Canadian. And that company is still in business. They're based here in Atlanta. In fact, we've prosecuted the owner I think three times now. Wow. So, He's been to jail twice. I don't sure what happened. The, I, the third case, uh, I retired before and I haven't heard what, what happened. The point being is you don't know where that stuff is made mm -hmm. when you're just ordering mm -hmm. it off the internet. This is good stuff because I know there's a lot of people out there who are thinking about it, considering it and thinking, oh, I'll save money if I buy it from my local dealer or if I buy it from the, you know, the internet or whatever. This is your health. It, if you're going to do it, do it through a doctor or do it through a clinic. This is becoming more mainstream now. And I would still a bit of a taboo topic because I know some family doctors don't even want to talk about hormone replacement therapy and you have to go to a, an actual clinic, but it is becoming more and more acceptable. And I actually know some people personally who uh, are actually getting proper hormone replacement therapy through their family doctors now, which is nice to see that the doctors are becoming more open-minded regarding this and not just saying, oh, testosterone's going down, live with it, deal with it. Right. It's an important part of health. Right. It really is. Well, and that was when I went in for the initial consultation. I thought, oh, are they just going to prescribe to everyone that walks in the door? And they didn't. Um, they, they looked at my numbers. My numbers were borderline. The upper 200, you know, the normal is at 300. So it was my choice. But it wasn't, on, oh, my God, you're low. You know, that, that sort of thing that you must have this. Sure, they're thrilled that I'm on it because they make more money. I get that. And I'm happy with, with the results. Right now, my um, testosterone level is in the 700s. So even though I'm taking it, it's not like jacking it up beyond 
whatever. But definitely, I, I would not recommend not. To, I would you have to go through a doctor, in my opinion. Um, I would be real scared not to. But you just uh, you don't know what you're getting. You don't know the dosages. If you're not getting checked, maybe you're taking too much. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, when I started out, it was two shots a week, Monday and Thursday, a half a milligram each time. Well, it was 220 altogether for the week. When I went in for the first testing, it was way up. So we, we took it down to a third. So it's a 0.3 instead of a 0.5. Um, and we've adjusted it down since then each time. Oh, and then I also have to take, I'm one of them that's a person that is susceptible to having my uh, estrogen level, the estradiol jack. Mm -hmm. So I've had that. It's still real tricky for me. If I take a full pill per week, I would normally take a half a pill on the same with a shot Monday and Thursday. My estrogen level would tank. So I would go down to like a two. And what the recommended level was, was 20. I'm very sensitive to that. So now I take a half pill every three weeks or so, or if I feel like I need it. And I can tell when I need it because all of a sudden I, I will get super emotional over the stupidest things. And mm -hmm. they literally told me that. They said, you, you, will, you will know. You'll be emotional. You'll get upset over stuff that you shouldn't be getting upset over. And I hate to say that you sound like a woman, but that's what the doctor said. It'd be like, you're going to feel like uh, PMSing is basically what they said. If you feel like you're PMSing, take a half pill. And I, I just had to pay attention to that. Because here again, if your estradiol is too high or too low, too mm -hmm. low is not good. If it's yep. too high, it can cause all the same side effects that too high of um, testosterone does. And that, that's important to note because, again, you don't want it, as you mentioned, too high or too low because too low increases your risk of injury. Like having healthy estrogen levels is very good for joint health and right. like preventing injuries. And when it's rock bottom, like this is a big reason why a lot of competitive bodybuilders who are on anti-estrogens and they try to keep their estrogen rock bottom so they lose as much water and body fat and just come in as diced and shredded as possible. But they're so susceptible to injuries. And this is where you see a lot of guys getting injured leading up in the weeks before show because it's just like the perfect storm for an injury. They're so depleted from the dieting. Then they have their estrogen suppressed from the anti-estrogen medications. They're so susceptible to injuries. And you see a lot of guys getting injured leading up to competition. And that's that's part of the problem right there. But at the same time, you don't want it too high because you mentioned the emotional things, but also water retention and it makes it harder to lose body fat and all that stuff as well. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I appreciate you for sharing this and being so open and transparent because like, it's not as simple as, as a lot of people think it is. They think, oh, I'm just going to take a shot a week. It's not a set it and forget it type of thing. There's a lot of work to well, this. And for me, I don't care. It doesn't bother me to talk about it. A lot of people, oh, they don't want to talk to you if you take testosterone. I'm 60. Things don't work the way they did when I was 30 or 20 or whatever. I get that. Mm -hmm. I'm not embarrassed to talk about it. I'm not embarrassed that I'm on it. What do I care? It is what it is. And I don't look at it. Everyone says, oh, well, you're cheating. Well, no. It's the same as with any steroid. You can take all the steroids that you want. If you don't do the workout, it's not going to do any good. If it were that easy, everyone would be taking a shot. Unless you're competing in a drug tested event, which specifically says that you're not allowed to take, right. you're not cheating anything. All it's doing is it's bringing me back within the normal range, which is yep. what 300 to 900 or something. Mm -hmm. I'm basically in the middle of, of the, the range now where I was at the low end, if not below. I've never looked at it as a cheating or, a, oh, yeah, okay, so I'm enhanced. Whoop de doo. That doesn't bother me that somebody wants to say, oh, you're enhanced, you're not natural. Okay. It is what it is. If that makes you feel better about yourself, like in terms of health and fitness and your confidence and all that, like that has such a big impact. You know, like a lot of times people have the symptoms of low testosterone and they'll go to their doctor and very often the symptoms are similar to symptoms of depression. So right. doctors will end up putting them on an antidepressant. So now you have low testosterone and you're, you're, you're band-aiding the symptoms with an antidepressant. It's not fixing the root problem. Whereas if you can get healthy testosterone levels and now you start to feel like a man again, that can improve your confidence, improve your strength, your energy, your sex drive. I mean, like when all that stuff is working, you feel a lot more confident. And let's be honest, if, if you're not feeling like a man and you're suffering from depression and the, the man unit downstairs isn't working and you're feeling the low energy and blah, suicide is a big issue. Yeah. Right? Suicide is a more men commit suicide than, than women. I mean, that's the reality of life. So this could be a 
to not just a a physical pr performance booster, but it could be a mental and life performance booster. I mean, this could give you more purpose to live even in yeah. some cases. I hope in the future this becomes more common knowledge, and I'm pretty sure it will because there's such a big movement for it. It's, it's, it can't be ignored, right? Like doctors are not going to be able to just ignore this in the future. I appreciate you for sharing this and being so open and transparent. And this kind of leads into the next thing. I mean, now here you are, 60 years old, best shape of your life, and a bodybuilding show coming up this fall. November. Right. So, I mean, like, how is your training transition now, knowing that you're getting ready for a bodybuilding show? Like, has, has anything really changed or has it just been more focused? My diet's changed a little bit. So starting in January, I started to diet down to see how things looked. Yeah. And not, very small deficit. But training wise, it's, it's the same. I, I, everything I do, I am trying to keep my focus on my goal. So I actually have the date. November 2nd of 2024, 20, uh, the Lee Haney games, it's written on a piece of paper on my wall in the basement. So every workout, I see that that date. I have to think about everything that I'm eating. Uh, yeah, I would like to cheat. I would like to have a piece of pizza. I would like to have had the ice cream up at the lake with the rest of the family. How is that going to get me to my goal in November? Is it going to affect it? Yes, it's going to. So yeah, for the next few months, it, it's going to suck. I get that. But it's, it's just one of those, I just have to remember, you know, ultimately uh, you know, what I want to do. And I also have a cruise the week after the show. So, <laughs> so there you go. I'm also not planning on trying to shovel everything in my mouth after the show and gain, you know, 40 pounds in a week or something. I don't want to do that. But going on a trip, making sure like we went up to the lake, it's a two day drive. Oh, it happened to coincide with my two rest days. So to further explain that, my present workout schedule is four days on, one day off. Four times through that workout cycle, I take two days off. So it happened to work out both going to the lake and coming back. My two days were my travel days. So I sat in the car driving on my rest days. But then I made sure I was at the gym the next time. I don't miss a workout. Well, I try not to. I shouldn't say I don't miss them. It's a rarity. And um, I basically, I have had to reschedule a few. Maybe something came up. Uh, so instead of, um, for example, I had tendonitis, uh, a flare-up of tendonitis. So instead of doing my bicep workout, I quit doing that. And But then when I added it back in, I added it to my shoulder day, which is normally just a morning workout and nothing in the afternoon. So I moved it from my back day to my shoulder day. And the reason why I did that is because doing parallel grip pull downs is what caused the, the tendonitis to flare up. So I've had to el eliminate that move, but then I also didn't want to do anything, doing all those pulling exercises and then try to do biceps. So I, I call it rescheduling. I don't skip. And the same with legs. I, I have never skipped a leg day except when I had surgery and I, ha I had two weeks off uh, because the doctor said I had to take two weeks off. But I, ju I just try to remember that this is where we're going to get. I've been lucky so far cutting back on the food. I've not had a huge energy loss. Some days are better than others. I will have maybe some additional blueberries, you know, in the afternoon before I do my workout. But as I, as I told you last week, I did binge eat on blueberries up at the lake. I found out I'm a stress eater. Uh, it was three weeks with a whole lot of family at the house. So my stress eating was blueberries. That's, that's a pretty good way to binge. If you're, if you're well, going to I figured that's better than ice cream. I um, gave up alcohol a year and a half ago, so I didn't, didn't break into the liquor cabinet, although Congratulations I was that. tempted. But here again, I know what happens when you drink. You have to burn all the alcohol in your system before it burns any fat. So how's that going to help me? Uh, and here again, I'm not one that would drink uh, alcohol because I like the feeling. I like the taste. Yeah, I gave that up in December of 2022 uh, as I started looking toward doing a show. But everything is focused on November. So going out to dinner. Yes, I went out to dinner with the family. They went out three times. I uh, The first place they went was a wonderful Thai restaurant. But I know that it's high in sodium and I have an intolerance to sodium. So I just had my air grilled or my air fried chicken while they had that. We went out two other times. One, I had a steak mm -hmm. and one, I had two hamburger patties. So it fit within my present meal plan. I didn't order a bunch of crap to go along with it. So I, I wanted a baked potato. Mine came with fries and my wife ordered a baked potato and we swapped. 
you know, that sort of thing to make it work. When I travel, I take my my food with me. People laugh at me. I've been on an airplane before with my bag of chicken breast and rice, including the the flight attendant who announced to everybody that that they were going to be serving snacks that would not be as good as what this guy's eating. I was like, oh, great. So I changed uh-huh. mind. This trip, I um, bought an, an electric lunchbox that plugs into the cigarette lighter of the car. Works really well. It he- will heat your food in about 30 minutes. Traveling up and as well as home from the lake, uh, I stopped halfway and visited with my sister and they went to a pizza place and I took my chicken with me and uh, I fed myself at the, the pizza place. They just, people look at me and they, they don't even, they don't even question it. And, you know. But I found too that since I'm not eating sodium, I can go into a restaurant and say, hey, can you fix my steak with no seasoning, including salt? And they had no problem with that. They were real happy to do that where I felt like I was, you know, stepping on toes or didn't want to insult the chef or, or anything like that. And they were, they were fine. Not a problem, but everything it's trying to focus on November. So is it a good choice or is it not a good choice to have whatever it is? Having this goal, like you're, you're getting ready for this show. It helps you to be more focused and more mindful of all these little decisions, like all these little things where if you didn't have that contest looming, it's a lot easier to say, ah, screw it. It's just one cheat meal. It's just one day. I'll get back on track tomorrow. And, you, you know, literally, if you just did it for one day, it wouldn't be a big issue. But the thing is, it's not just one day because there's going to be another day and another day and another day. And like right. you just listed off several different scenarios where you had to make the best of what was available for you. Simple things like having the baked potato instead of the French fries, you know, ordering your steak without the seasonings and stuff and bringing your own food, like having your own (laughs) air fried chicken with you. All these little decisions, it all adds up. It's like adding another brick in the wall, like every single one it's adding up versus if you just went with the status quo and said, oh, screw it. I'll just have a slice of pizza. Oh, screw it. I'll eat whatever. I'll eat the French fries. All the that's a step back. Right? Every time you do that, there's one step back versus one step forward. Well, and as you said, if I cheat one time, I'm probably going to cheat again the next time. Like with ice cream, uh-huh. you know, we had I think three different half gallons of ice cream of different flavors yep. uh, up at the lake house because my grandson liked one. My son-in-law is now diabetic and had a sugarless ice cream, and then uh, licorice ice cream, which my wife loves. Okay, I had, th- I had three choices. I could have made, well, I had four choices. Any one of those flavors or nothing. I chose nothing. Um, had my blueberries. That was good. It is what it is. And I know that it's it's a limited period that I have to do this. Yeah. And it's just rem- tr- always trying to tell myself, is this going to further me getting to that goal? The other thing that I've done is um, working on posing practice. That is um, a challenge for anyone that hasn't tried doing posing. Uh, it's not just flexing. It's like flexing it, but doing it right. And the other thing was buying a posing suit. That was fun. Uh, putting that on the first time. And, that, mm. and I thought, hey, that doesn't look too horrible. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, the little things you don't think about that you're going to need a little bit of confidence walking around with wearing next to nothing. And a spray tan. Oh, I've, I've done a spray tan once to see what that was like. That was a whole lot of fun. <laughs> Yeah. The, the bodybuilding tan is they, they step it up a notch. I mean, it's the same process, basically. They're right. spraying it down, but it's just a, a extra dark shade, if you will. Right? Well, and learning wow. how to do it. I mean, I'm glad that I did it once. And in fact, I, I, I think I bought two at the time. I can go and have it done again. So you have to wear basically like a, a, a shower cap or something so you, it doesn't spray in your hair. Well, you have to make sure that's up high enough or you have a nice line across your forehead. That was lovely. <laughs> so then you're like for a couple of weeks thinking mm, are people looking at my my strange line across my forehead <laughs> tan line right across <laughs> it's just all the things you, you don't even think about that that are an issue or that or that are a challenge or, or whatever but you know it's interesting when when you do the posing practice and you sent me a videotape and I've watched that and I've seen several people online and you think you're doing it right. And then you look at a picture and it's like, that's not even close to mm-hmm. the way it should be. Little, little things can make a huge difference. And if people who take a lot of progress pictures will know like hey, there's a certain position, a certain lighting make me look the best. But then with your poses too, like ever so slightly, sometimes just twisting the body a certain way or, emphasizing a certain muscle group i mean it can change the pose entirely and it's all about 
hiding your weaknesses and accentuating your strengths. And it's, it's a, it really just comes down to practice trial and error. And then also getting feedback from people who know what it is they're right. looking for. Cause if you hit a pose in front of your friends and family, you look great. Right. <laughs> they don't know what they're looking for. Right. Well, and one thing that I noticed too, is you could always tell when someone has practiced. I went to the, the same show I'm going to compete at right. last year and you could tell who practiced and who didn't. Is, for example, I, I look at your your posing. You look very relaxed. You have a great smile. You look very confident. I saw a lot of people that clearly had not practiced a whole lot, especially like the novice group. It was their first show. I totally get that. I probably look the same. But I want to go in so I at least look somewhat confident and somewhat relaxed. Oh, teeth, teeth whitening. I've done that, too. There you go. You're thinking of all this stuff I never thought I would do at 60. Right. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, all the stuff that goes into the contest prep is, is a lot of work. But at the end of the day, I mean, I think it'll be a, quite a rewarding experience. I've never met anybody yet who has done a bodybuilding show and and did it properly. All the stuff that you're talking about here, like you're putting in the work. At the end of the day, regardless of where you place, I mean, as long as you go in there knowing that you did your best, it's going to be a very satisfying and rewarding experience. And this was an amazing conversation, Mike. Thanks so much for sure. Uh, Jeff, is there any you have any questions for Mike or anything you want to add to this? I mean, like, no, Mike, good luck, man. We're all rooting for you here. Yeah. You'll be seeing more pictures between now and then, I'm sure. Yeah, man, big inspiration to all of us. And that's good because, you know, it's 60. I never thought I would do this when I retired. Um, mm -hmm. I started working out in August of 2020. I retired in December, which wasn't originally planned, mm -hmm. but uh, it's been a lot of fun. It was not, it certainly was not on my bucket list. In fact, there was a post that came up last December, you know, I'm retiring. Ugh, it's my last day of work. And what am I going to do? Get into photography and fishing. I've not, well, photography, I've, I've taken a class now, but fishing, I bought a fishing pole three years ago. It still didn't have the line on it. Still has the hang, the, the price tag hanging <laughs> on it someday. Yeah. But, yeah, this is, this was not planned, but it, it's been a lot of fun and it's nice to learn something that you can do something different and new. Totally. I mean, most people in their 40s and beyond, they're they're almost second guessing and, and even questioning whether it's even possible to get in shape. Like I, I know people that like I went to high school with and, and people my age and sometimes even younger. Like I even get messages from guys in their 30s saying, oh, I, I'm 30 years old. Like, am I too old to start working out? Am I too old to start building muscle? And I mean, the fact that you started getting serious at, when you were 56 mm -hmm. I mean, like start basically started as a beginner at 56 yeah. years old. Right. And here it is now, just four years later, which we, we got to put things in perspective because some people, they hear four years, like, oh my God, four years, that's so long. Like four years is a blink of an eye. It's it's by, it, it really has. I mean, it has gone by quickly. And there's, I've, in some of my fitness groups, I'm in a bunch of uh, Facebook fitness groups for like people that are 40 and above, 50 above, 60 above. And they're, occasionally oh is it 40 too late and i'll post my picture here this is 56 this is 60 no it's not too late i mean you can make it work right it, there's so many ways to make it work so mike looking back at this now i mean if you had to do it all over again what would you do differently is is there any lessons learned or, or things you'd change I wouldn't pay attention as much to crap on the internet just because it's an official group of something doesn't mean that it's legitimate. Um, I would have hired a legitimate coach sooner. So somebody that knows what they're doing, someone with experience. Um, the guy that I hired was actually uh, found out after the fact was actually the son-in-law of the owner of that band group, which I did not know. Uh, he had recommended this guy in that group, which is why I hired him, mm -hmm. not knowing the family connection. So I would, I should have done more research on hiring a coach, but those are the, really the only two things. And there's probably, you know, things that I've done exercise wise, I wish I hadn't done the carnivore diet being one of them. As I've said before, somebody said, Oh, don't you wish you had started sooner? Well, oh, probably, but I can't look backwards. I, what's that going to do? I'm not going to look back with regret. Oh, I wish I'd done this 30 years ago. Pfft, that doesn't do any good. Let's look what's going forward, what the goal is. But, you know, hiring a coach that knows what, what he's doing, Lee, um, most definitely uh, made a difference to me. Now, everybody didn't want to hire a coach, and I, I get that. But here again, you know, you can't skimp on hiring a coach. I, I had a friend of mine, a Facebook friend, wanted to know what my workout program was. He was trying to get all the details, and it's like, you know, I paid for this program. 
Um, that's somebody's IP. You know, I'm not going to just share it to you and give it away. Well, he just, you know, he didn't know if he could afford it, blah, blah, blah. Well, the week after that, he had posted about going to the Super Bowl to see Rihanna. Well, you made a choice there on what you could afford. All right. You know? What you want to do, as we mentioned before. Exactly. So you want to give me my workout program free while you're going off to the Super Bowl? Yeah, no. Mm -hmm. And I chose to invest my money differently. It is what it is. I respect that. And what you just mentioned there, like a lot of people say, if what if you started earlier? Or isn't it a shame that you didn't start earlier? Like, I've seen the opposite, especially like where I've started bodybuilding when I was 17. Like I did my first show as a teenager in high school. Right. So I started very young. And as I was going through bodybuilding throughout my teens and 20s and 30s, I seen a lot of people hit their peak in that time frame, like in their 20s or 30s. You know, they, they hit their peak in terms of bodybuilding physique. So their peak in muscularity and strength. And then, you know, something usually happens, you know, they they you know get married, have kids, you know. <laughs> become a grown up and have real responsibilities and all of a sudden now they can't dedicate you know six days a week multiple hours a day to the gym so they can kind of let it slide or sometimes they get injured or whatever happens like you know people are in their peak shape and then something happens and they kind of lose it and a lot of times they don't have the same motivation and drive to get back in shape because they know that well i'll never be as good as i once was yeah you know like hey back when i was 30 years old, hey, I could bench press 400 pounds, or I was such and such a weight on stage with shredded six pack abs and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, I'm never going to get back to there again. Why even try? And I've seen so many people who were amazing bodybuilders, and in some cases, amazing powerlifters, you know, in great shape in their early days, don't even work out anymore. Yeah. Because they, they, lost that drive because they're always comparing themselves to their old version and it's like well if i can't be as good as i was what's the point of even trying whereas what you're doing getting better with age so like you are 60 years old literally in the best shape of your life if we had to look at what's better long term overall the way you're going about it is actually a much better approach where you're excited about moving forward versus looking back and regret like imagine you were a competitive bodybuilder back in the day and you're like, Oh, well, I'll never do that. Yeah. And you just ha have no hope for the future. Well, I'm looking at it as I'm going into retirement uh, in the best shape ever. Isn't yeah. that exciting? Yeah. With, with a grandchild, you know, and you know, all the fun stuff that I get to do now that yeah. I don't have to worry about going to work. So I, ha I do have that time. That is so exciting. I mean, I'm, that gives me hope for the future. Like I'm looking at the way you're living your life now. I'm like, that, that's, I want to be like Mike. <laughs> I want to do what Mike is doing because most people we know, and as they get into their retirement years, like their health is starting to decline. Their mobility is starting to go down. And yes, they have the time, but they don't have the body to utilize that time and do what they want to do. Their body is holding them back, complaining of their aches and pains and mobility issues and yada 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 i mean it, that's a fact of life but to see you working out and and you I mean not only working out but taking it seriously and now even getting ready for a competition i mean what kind of a role model are you for like your kids i mean the, they're seeing this you know your kids your grandkids like this is having an impact subconsciously yeah i, I think so um my son-in-law just discovered he's diabetic did not know he apparently has been diabetic for maybe five years did not know um, so now he's talking about uh, getting into uh, healthy lifestyle and fitness. Uh, he's already changed his diet. So one step at a time, which is great. I never thought I'd be a, a fitness role model. I mean, that is the furthest thing. If you had asked me, hey, what are you going to do when you retire? That would not have been it. But I'm, I'm very humbled by it. If someone, somebody says, you know, you inspire me. Mm -hmm. And it, literally, it's one of those, if I can do it, you can do it type things. And I mean that because this is nothing... This, this is not regaining the body of the 20 year old that I had back then. Cause I, I didn't. <laughs> it really is just, there's, there's no magic bullet or magic secret. It's just the consistency, the, the dedication and being willing to put yourself in those situations to, to learn, like yeah. you know, to get the help you need and to seek out the advice, you know, from coaches and to seek out like hormone replacement therapy because you needed it. And right. Like, instead of just, sitting and wallowing like oh what if or i don't know what to do poor me like right. okay, i don't know what to do but i'm going to find out S somebody knows what to do and i'm going to find that person right. and get the 
get them to help you. It's amazing what you've achieved. So again, thanks for sharing this. And uh, I'm looking forward to following along with that competition. All right, November, November down in Atlanta, November second. Well, keep us posted with how that goes, and we'll be we'll be certainly following along with your journey leading right up to that. I appreciate it. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe to the podcast. And if you know someone who could benefit from today's episode, please feel free to share it with them. I mean, if you could help us to spread the word, that's going to help to get this message out there and allow us to create more content like this and reach more people and just create that positive impact all around. And if you would like some help with your own fitness goals, you know, maybe it's building muscle, losing fat, improving your health, getting in your best shape. If you would like some help with that, then feel free to reach out to me. I have my contact information down in the show notes below, and you can book in for a free one-on-one -on -one strategy session coaching call with me, and we can discuss a realistic action plan that's right for you. And if I feel that you're a good fit, I may invite you to come on board and join our VIP coaching program. And if it's not a good fit and I feel that I'm not the right person to help you, then I'm not going to give you a hype or BS, but I will point you in the right direction to somebody who can help you. I mean, I've got a large network of people in the fitness industry, so if I don't feel that you're a good fit for our coaching program or that I can help you, I'll be able to point you in the right direction to somebody who can. So either way, at the end of your free strategy session coaching call, you'll walk away with better insights on what you need to do next in order to reach your health and fitness goals. So that clues it up for today's episode. And we'll be back again next Tuesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time with another episode of the Total Fitness Bodybuilding Podcast. Take care. Over and out.